All right, first lesson, short lesson, I think. Uh, I have it titled, uh, The Bible Needs to Be the Basis of the Political Debate. Uh, this is government class, and we're going to talk about, you know, uh, when is it right to go to war? War theory. Everyone gets excited about that one. It's actually not as exciting as it sounds. Or, um, uh, you know, taxes. Should we pay taxes? What should be taxes collected for? You know, um, how, what, what types of things should the government do? How should the government be organized? Is there anything in the Bible that describes or gives us some indication of how the government should be organized? We're going to look at those types of things, and we're going to attempt to, and uh, hopefully succeed, at basing our thoughts on what the Bible says. All right, not just, um, there, there are some very good writers through history, and we've, we're going to read some of them. We're going to read the law. Um, but he doesn't run necessarily back to the Bible. It's his opinion. He gives some very good um, thoughts about it. Uh, Economics in One Lesson, very good book. Uh, but he doesn't run it back to the Bible particularly. He gets to, I think, a correct biblical position. Uh, but if we don't run it back to the Bible and base our beliefs on the Bible, then it really does come down to just everybody's opinion. You know, Joseph thinks that, you know, we should have two presidents, and Jacob thinks we need three, and Megan thinks we should get rid of all the presidents. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, it's just, it's just opinion, all right, without some concrete foundation for truth. And we accept that, I think, readily uh, when we talk about salvation and, you know, how the church should operate in other places. There's, we run to the Bible. But as Christians, we should do the same thing with with government and what we expect the government to do and, and what it shouldn't do and how it should do things and what rights uh, should the government protect and those types of things. So we want to make the Bible that unchanging uh, basis um, of the debate. Uh, well, that's my title and the first point, if you want to put it. There needs to be an unchanging basis for a political discussion. It can't just be a logical discussion. My wife gets aggravated. You can just universally accept that as true in regards to me. Um, but she also gets aggravated at talk radio, all right? Because very rarely does anybody say, well, God says this. They'll call in and say, well, this is what I think, or this is what I think, or that's unfair. They'll, they'll, it, it boils down to everybody giving their opinion, all right? It's not too often that someone will say, well, you know, uh, God who made us <laughs> uh, says this. It, it's kind of refreshing every now and then to hear that, or at least some, hear somebody recognize the fact that we're created by God with rights that come from God. It's not just, you know, our system of government protects these certain rights and some other country has another system of government and they don't protect those, you know, just who cares, different, different opinions. No, to run it back to the Bible is kind of refreshing. Every now and then I'll hear that, uh, but not too often. I still listen to it. Um, I, don't, I don't immerse myself in it because I would go batty. Um, but it, it really does boil down to most of the time discussion about different people's opinion. All right? uh, the opinion on at least conservative talk radio is much more accurate, I think, much more correct because it does, they might not recognize it, but it does run back to the Bible as its foundation. Um, but as Christians, we need to Take it back to there, all right? Uh, we, we um, well, let me, let me actually give you my points here. Uh, the first one is if there's a logical discussion, then everybody's opinion is valid. If it's just uh, a debate and we don't have some concrete um, foundation of truth. Liberals hate absolute truth. I mean, everything's relative. Uh, the, even, even the Constitution is a living document that changes with time. Maybe we should do that with our lecture material and the test. You know, I'll say one thing today, and by the time of the test, what I said today actually would be different, and I could test you over something I didn't say, but I could claim that I did say it because it's a living lecture. Right? We look at it and think, that's really, really stupid, and you're right, it'd be really, really stupid. But liberals hate things, they, they hate uh, unchanging facts that they can't get around. So they always, they claim everything is relative and it's just everybody's opinion. Uh, conservatives aren't a whole lot better because they, 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 they will say, you know, this is unchanging and this is always right, but 
It's just the, the foundation that they put under it is their opinion. Or maybe they'll go to uh, writers through history that have supported that opinion. They won't say, well, this is unchanging because of God. And we've got to make sure to recognize that. So uh, without, this, there's a, without this, it just becomes a logical discussion, and everybody's opinion is as valid as the next person's. All right. Uh, the second thing, if you want to put it, if there's an unchanging basis, if there's this unchanging foundation, then there's unchanging truth. There are certain things that are just right. They're not up for debate. And as Christians, we need to be willing to point that out. So, you know, I'm, I'm against abortion <laughs> because it's murder. <laughs> the Bible talks about unborn uh, babies as people, not as tissue. <laughs> and it's murder. That's why I'm against it. Um, there are all kinds of, you could talk about all kinds of logical arguments and, you know, how there's other families that would adopt these unwanted children, supposedly, and you can go on and on and on. But ultimately, <laughs> if yours is based on your opinion and someone else has another opinion, it's just, it's just an argument about opinion. But if you want to back to the Bible, uh, then there's this unchanging truth. Right? The, the Bible and God is not going to change, and we have an unchanging truth um, that um, doesn't change because it's unchanging. So, uh, we need to, it's very easy for us to start discussions with phrases like I think or I feel uh, instead of God says or God's position is. All right, it's, um, I've not even been a lot of opportunities where I'm talking to a, a group of liberals, um, but it's kind of fun to just throw that out. Well, I th God, I think, talks about this and just, you know, the panic that, that flares up on some people's faces. <laughs> but you're probably thinking like me, like, ooh, I don't know if, I don't know if I want to bring that up in a public setting, you know, the God, you know, that's kind of, well, why not? I mean, we shouldn't be embarrassed uh, to bring it up, and we've got to run our arguments back to there. So. All right, um, so that's the first point. We need this unchanging basis uh, for our political discussions. We're, that's what we're going to attempt to do this semester with the areas we look at. We'll, I'll bring up an issue. Sometimes we'll kind of talk about the topic of issues to understand it, and then we'll look at the Bible and try to see what we can glean from the Bible. Now, if the Bible had, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, government philosophy, Deuteronomy, and so on, <laughs> you know, if, if, we had a, if we had a book where God describes to us how the government is supposed to operate, it would be easier. But that's not the whole point of the Bible, all right? The, the whole point of the Bible is to provide salvation and describe Christ and how we're sinners. I mean, so it's, it's not a political textbook, but there are all kinds of principles and examples, and we can look and see how Christ or God set up the Old Testament system for the Jews. You can look at the system he set up and glean principles from it. So there's lots of, lots of places we can glean and uh, get ideas from it, and we'll do that. If there was a, a government philosophy section, it would make it much easier, but that is not the main point of the Bible. All right, let me give you some examples, just, uh, just to kind of get your mind thinking of, of how we can do this. The first one I kind of already hit upon uh, is abortion. <clears throat> I hope we're all against abortion. If you want to argue that God supports abortion, that would be an interesting <laughs> discussion. It's wrong, okay? It's wrong because it's abortion, uh, because it's abortion, because it's murder. Uh, can anybody think of anything in particular in the Bible that points us in that direction? <coughs> Maybe it doesn't. I mean, I could be wrong. What does God actually say? There's a lot. I'm, every year, somebody will bring up something I haven't thought about before. But there, there's... Thou shalt not kill. Okay, if thou shalt not kill. Right. We have to, I mean, if, it's, if we uh, accept that it's living, then that would apply. But there's people who say, oh, it's just, a, it's just tissue. It's not living yet. Does the Bible ever indicate that that unborn baby isn't just tissue? That's a sick thought, to claim it's just tissue. I mean, just look at it. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, well. Does it? And can we think of any time where the Bible talks about an unborn child as more than just tissue? Maybe God's for abortion. I don't know. <laughs> I know, I'm putting you on the spot, but it, we just came through Christmas. What happened when Mary went to see her cousin? Mary nodded her head. <laughs> Different Mary. <laughs> Yeah, Elizabeth talks about, wow, a baby leaped in my womb. She, it wasn't 
I, you know, I flex my stomach muscles. <laughs> this, this separate entity responded in her womb, all right, recognizes as a separate living creature. So there's a phrase, uh, the Bible talks about God knowing us in the womb before we were born, all right? Every indication there is that it's a living separate entity. It is not just flesh. So we have the fact that it's wrong to, it's wrong to commit murder and the unborn babies are alive. They're not just flesh and we can't kill them. All right, so abortion, we gotta, <clears throat> um, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's wrong to you know, say, well, look at, look at pictures, uh, you know, ultrasound pictures of babies or look at, look at you know, babies that were born two months early or three months early that live. You can, all that is true and it's, it's further support that, wow, these things are actually alive. But the Bible also points us in that direction. Okay, so abortion. All right, next one. Um, how big should the government be? How big should the government be? Uh, there's a website that I like to waste time at. I know you have none of those. Um, it's called Prager University, and uh, he is in the middle. It's, a, the, um, it's by Dennis Prager, if you know that name. It's a conservative uh, talk show host. He puts together five-minute uh, presentations on all kinds of different things. There's all kinds of people uh, give presentations. But he's in the middle of a five-part series about what's different between conservatives and, and liberals. What's the difference? I haven't watched them yet, but one of them is how big should the government be? Right. Is it just opinion? I've, uh, do we have any Canadians in here? Oh, good. So we can make fun of them all year <laughs> without recourse. I've had Canadians, not to bash them, but I, I've had them say, well, you know, we don't mind. We get, we get taxed, and then the government provides health care. Well, we don't think that's a bad deal. And we're saying, no, 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 we want to buy our own health care. And they're saying, well, it doesn't matter. You spend the money and get health care, or the government takes and provides health care. Either way, you spend about the same and you get health care. And Mary's saying, no, no, there's a big difference. And there is a big difference, okay? Okay, and, but we've got to make it more than me saying, oh, no, no, it's different. Is, is there anything in the Bible that indicates that health care really isn't something the government should be involved in? Or, uh, you know, you pick the thing. How, how big should it be? Any thoughts? Not necessarily about health care, but just any ideas about how big the government should be. Is there any indication of the job of government in the Bible? If you're here first semester, we looked at some verses, I believe the first day, <coughs> that gave us the role of government. Punishing evil? There's two of them. <laughs> Rewarding, good. Rewarding the good, or protecting the good, providing a, a system for the good to succeed. Right? That, that's the job that's indicated for the government. I, I think a very good analogy for us to understand that with is a referee at a basketball game. He's, he's there to um, call fouls and prevent people from cheating, and that allows the good to succeed. Right, so, so we have indication in the Bible about how much the government should do, and health care doesn't, doesn't fit in there by any stretch. All right, um, another one, abstinence versus uh, other forms of birth control. I mean, should we, should we, uh, is it fair to tell girls and, and you know, teenagers to be completely abstinent, or should we just teach them about birth control? Hopefully you're not struggling with, you know, the Bible position on that one. <laughs> okay. uh, abstinence, because that's what God says. Okay. We can go on and argue that it works better and, you know, and other moral factors um, and other, other factors like that, but ultimately God teaches that, and that's why, we, that's why we pick it. All right, what about racism? Does God advocate racism? We scared off all of our black students, too. We've got a southerner in the room. We're in trouble. Anybody else? You claim the South. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, we're in trouble. All right. uh, what does the Bible teach about racism? Does it advocate it? Does it teach? I mean, the, the Southern slave owners said it did. You know, the, the blacks were predestined by God to be slaves. Okay. The Bible doesn't. All right. It does not teach it. We can look at, uh, look at uh, passages in Acts where God talks about we're all of one blood and there's no difference. All right. So it doesn't teach it. It's not just, you know, our culture teaches it or doesn't teach it. God. So, all right, let's go on here. Um, this one's, well, it's still up. Uh, the idea of giving extra punishment for hate crimes. I bring this up mostly because I think it's kind of funny. Um, if you murder somebody and it's determined that you hated them, then that's somehow worse than if you like them, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. What to, I don't know. <laughs> 
it's always brought up with race or religion. You know, if I go out and I murder somebody just because they're a Muslim, then that'd be a hate crime. If a Muslim murders me because I'm a Christian, that's never considered a hate crime. <laughs> or if I murder somebody just because they're black, it's considered a hate crime. And anyway, should we have this idea, somehow these extra punishments um, for these especially egregious, mur egregious murders, supposedly? Or is it just, it's just murder? I mean, okay. Any thoughts about what God says? Is there a hate crime? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I remember George Bush, uh, when he was running for president, uh, not, not, not senior, the junior, the son. There was um, some two, two white guys in Texas that drug a black guy to death behind their pickup truck. And they were, they were convicted, they were gonna get executed. And he was getting questioned in the debates about how you're against hate crimes. How, well, how could you be against hate crimes for that type of murder? And his response is, we're gonna execute them. <laughs> what else should we do? Dance in their grave and you know, step street? I don't know what, what else do we do? We're gonna kill them. Um, anyway, the Bible really doesn't support the, that what we think of as hate crimes. Right? It's wrong to murder. We punish them for the murder. It does allow, does allow some for motivation. All right? uh, if, you, if you kill somebody by accident, it allows for that to be treated different than if you go out and hunt somebody down and kill them. But this idea of hate crimes, it's really, it has no biblical foundation. So. All right, let's go on. The, uh, the death penalty. <clears throat> What's the biblical position on the death penalty? Or maybe is there a biblical position on the death penalty? I have a question about okay. the one before. So yeah. if you're like in an accident and you killed someone or like yeah. an accident, or if you actually shot and murdered someone, do you think there should be a difference? Oh, yes. Yeah. And the Bible does. The Bible recognizes that. If you think of the Old Testament Jewish law where they, they had the cities of refuge, and if you killed somebody by accident, you could flee to that city and then have a trial to determine if it really was an accident. <coughs> so, yeah, the Bible does recognize accident versus murder that the, thou shalt not kill is really thou shalt not kill without just cause, is the, the thought behind that. So, that um, the city of refuge thing really is, if you were found guilty of murder, then you got turned back over to the next of kin to be executed. That's an interesting, <laughs> if my brother gets murdered, it's my job to make sure his murderer is killed. And, if, and at trial, if, if, if the murderer was found guilty, they turned it back over to me. That's a very, very, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's so good, but <laughs> very different. Way to look. It, it is a good indication of, it throws, it puts the responsibility back on the people of the land. If you read verses in the Bible, it talks about, you know, uh, murderers have the blood having to be cleansed from the land. It put the responsibility back with the people. They couldn't just say, well, the police let them go. No, it was my job uh, to go hunt them down. So, but anyway, you brought it up. It was your fault. Uh, death penalty. Is there a biblical position, position on the death penalty? <laughs> okay, yes, God says murder should be executed. Um, but there's, there's a, in the swirl of debate today, there's people that say it's, a, it's cruel and unusual punishment, and they talk about as, as if this is a good argument. See, well, there's all the other civilized countries in the world got rid of the death penalty. We should join them. I don't, to me, that's like, no, if they're doing it, I don't want any part of it. Uh, but all that really is just window dressing. God says that murderers should be executed, and that's not a whole lot of wiggle room. All right, uh, feminism. Women, is God uh, all for the feminist movement? Give the right answer, Ephel. <laughs> oh, what does the Bible teach? Women should be in subjection to their husbands. Okay, not to all men in general, to their husbands. Okay, sometimes college guys get that confused. Their husbands. That's that's it. I mean, this modern idea of feminism. It's not supported by the Bible. Uh, this one I, I've had in my here for a long time, uh, but it's especially pertinent now. Gay rights and have beside that gay marriage. Right. Back at that, you know, 10 years ago, that was a far-fetched, crazy idea. It still is a far-fetched, crazy idea, but uh, it's been made law. But gay rights, do, do, do queers have rights? Is, is, is uh, sodomy a, a protected... 
<laughs> it's protected by God. <laughs> no, it's evil. It's an abomination. Read Romans. Um, read, read. Um, yes, uh, I was thinking I just lost the um, um, Sodom um, lot when he's in Sodom and angels come to see him. And it's, 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 it's not questioned in the Bible that sodomy is vile and evil and wicked. And can you imagine, you know, you're on Fox News and you bring up gay marriage and you say, well, you know, the Bible condemns it and says they should be executed. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I don't know if we should go that far with it, but it would be fine to say, well, as a Christian, this is condemned by the Bible. I mean, that's the end of the discussion. All right, that, that's it. So the, a, a new flavor of that is this gender identity stuff today. We're literally... You can be whatever gender you want to be. They, they claim that sex, male, female, is different from gender. <laughs> yes, right? <laughs> That's what they claim. And you can pick your gender. <laughs> there, uh, I, there was just a state um, out west someplace, Washington or someplace, that um, they're mandating statewide any public facility, which would include churches and schools and that type of thing. Uh, you have to allow people to go to the restroom that is of the gender they choose. Ugh, that's right. I mean, that's, that's just sick. That's not in the Bible. I've not done a deep biblical study to decide if there's a difference between sex and gender in the Bible, but <laughs> I think there's male and female in the Bible, and that's all. <laughs> there's, not, there's not this blending of, of, of the two. Uh, we've gotten to the point where gender is, is an, a state of mind. It really, it's just, it, it's, it's insane. So. All right, uh, gay marriage, gender identity. There, there's a push by the Democrats in Indiana this current legislative session to uh, have a law of that nature pass in Indiana where we'd have to, uh, it would apply to our school that if, uh, or our church, uh, some guy shows up on Sunday that claims he's a girl, we would be violating the law if we stopped it from going into the girls' bathroom. It, yeah. Just saying that you're segregating the bathroom by sex, by male and female, rather than by gender. Yeah, I, <laughs> that won't matter. That won't matter. <laughs> there, there's a, there's a, a lady in my father-in-law's church in Wisconsin. They're, they're pushing the same thing in Wisconsin. She's, she's from Nicaragua, and she said she's contemplating moving back to Nicaragua because she doesn't want her kids in a school with, with this going on. It's insane. It really is insane. And it really is funny to, when people bring up the idea, well, there'll be predators in the girls' bathroom. They say, oh, no, that'll never happen. <laughs> There's a lot of stupid people in this world. All right, gay marriage. Uh, next one. Uh, what rights do we have? We talked about gay rights. And people talk about their rights for this and that. Um, where, where do rights come from? God. Do we have any documents uh, in, uh, from her founding era that point that out? <laughs> oh, we do actually. Yeah. Can anybody think of one? We read it last semester. It questions on it on a test. <laughs> well, even before that. <laughs> We did read that one. It had questions on the test from that. Prior to that, the, the document, you know, July 4th, 1776, <laughs> Declaration of Independence, all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Right? So our own founding documents say these things come from God, which really makes it interesting when people claim that gay marriage is a right supported by our Constitution, which has as its foundation that the, the Declaration of Independence. I'd love to see them support that biblically. That'll never happen. But rights, I mean, we've got to run them back to God. That's where they come from. So. All right, another one that actually is very recent in the news, uh, gun control. Uh, the president just uh, couldn't get Congress. Stupid people in Congress, they won't do what he wants, so he signs executive orders. Um, doing things, well, if you read the, the uh, what do we call it, the, the Fairhaven Update News Fairman types. That, that I think it was on the front page. The widow of the American sniper, you know, questioning the president about all this, all these new executive orders. 
And he says none of them would have stopped any of the shootings. <laughs> would have done a thing for it. Uh, but anyway, gun control. Uh, can anybody think of a Bible position about gun control? I mean, I'm, I'm completely against gun control. <laughs> uh, but what does the Bible say? I might be wrong. Can anybody think? How many think the Bible would support gun control? You're just not sure exactly what verse to point at? I'm sorry, not gun control. Uh, freedom of guns. That's, I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing. So why are you all looking at me? <laughs> right. It doesn't support gun control. All right. Can anybody think of anything in the Bible that indicates that? What did, um, what did Christ tell his disciples in Luke 22, 35? I'm sure you have that memorized. Told them to sell their cloak. By a sword? <laughs> they didn't have guns back then, or he would have said gun. I mean, that was, that was the, the defensive weapon of the day. All right. There's other passages. Um, there's passages in the Old Testament law that talk about if you kill somebody as they're breaking into your house, there's no repercussions at all. I mean, I know it's completely within my, my rights to, to kill people that try to get into my house without my permission. Come and try it. <laughs> um, we have uh, passages to talk about uh, the father being responsible for his family. Right? And I, I wouldn't be a very responsible father if I let them get murdered and raped. What's your, what's your position on um, heavy weapons, like tanks or if they can afford it? <laughs> yeah, if they can afford it. No, there's some responsibility. I mean, you, I shouldn't be able to, you know, drive tanks up and down the road here because it's not my road. <laughs> There's definitely responsibility. The, the Second Amendment from last semester was intended for us to have the same weapons that the military has so we could defend ourselves from the government. So, what's that? A nuclear weapon? <laughs> Maybe there. <laughs> but fully automatic, it, it shouldn't even be a question. Uh, any calibers you want, but it, it really is, that's another question. <laughs> Gun control is not advocated by the Bible. So, um, so. Point made, I think. We want to, we're not going to, a lot of these we just skim through very quickly to, to try to get your, your mind going. But we're going to look at other issues like that and take some time to look in the Bible and look at what it says and try to come up with a biblical idea. I, hopefully for most of you, we're, we're, you don't come out here with radically different ideas about government. You know, hopefully you're already kind of in the right position, <laughs> but you might have some, a better understanding of why. Why, why is this the right position? Where, where in the Bible do we get support for this position? Why, why do Christians believe this? So, All right. See you Friday.